Hello and welcome back. In this video, we're going to be talking about quasi-experimental designs. Specifically, by the end of this lesson, you should be able to differentiate between quasi-experiments and true experiments, identify methods for establishing the conditions of causality, and practice evaluating threats to internal validity. Let's get started. So you may recall from our earlier discussions that there are three conditions of causality, covariance, temporal precedence, and internal validity. You may also recall that experiments are the best way to establish these three conditions of causality. By manipulating the IV conditions, the experiment creates clear conditions for comparisons. By manipulating the independent variable before measuring the dependent variable, an experiment establishes temporal precedence. And by assigning people to the IV conditions randomly or through some kind of unbiased method, this controls for confounds and meets the condition of internal validity. But are experiments always ideal? Sometimes it may just not be logistically possible to randomly assign people to conditions. Likewise, it may not always be ethical to do so. In addition, researchers may wish to examine the generalizability of findings outside of experimental contexts. As such, even though experiments are the gold standard for establishing internal validity, there may be situations under which a researcher may wish to evaluate an internal validity question, but may not be able to use an experiment to do so. For example, if we wanted to ask the question, does smoking cause cancer, then it would not really be logistically or ethically possible to randomly assign people to smoke versus not in order to track whether or not they get certain types of cancer. If we ask the question, are our smartphones ruining our relationships? Again, it would logistically be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to randomly assign people to use smartphones versus not. What about the effects of social isolation? We can't randomly assign people to experience social isolation versus not in order to examine what the relative impacts might be. So each of these questions lend themselves nicely to what are called quasi-experimental designs. A quasi-experimental design is a design that manually attempts to meet all three conditions of causality. For example, a quasi-experimental design might carefully select or create comparison groups in order to create ideal conditions for examining covariance. A quasi-experimental design might study a phenomenon over time, or what we would call longitudinally, in order to establish temporal precedence. And a quasi-experiment might try to isolate and control for potential confounds. So even when random assignment to conditions is not possible, there are still some steps that researchers can take to attempt to increase the internal validity of their research findings. Let's take a closer look. So we're going to start by talking about various comparison groups. You may recall that random assignment to conditions is the best way to create comparison groups because any time that we use non-random assignment to conditions, or what we would call a non-equivalent group condition, this raises the possibility of introducing certain confounds, such as selection effects. If we come back to our examples from earlier, you know, we can ask the question, in what ways might smokers differ from non-smokers beyond the behavioral pattern of smoking? Um, if we look at different conditions under which people might be socially isolated, such as during um, the COVID physical distancing, or people who are working on research expeditions in Antarctica? Are there ways that social isolation differs from not being socially isolated in ways other than social isolation itself? So for example, do COVID's physical distancing measures differ from non-physical distancing measures in more ways than just social isolation? Are um, smartphone users different from non-smartphone users in more ways than simply smartphone use? So if we answer in the affirmative to any of these questions, then we're saying that yes, there is a possibility for a selection effect. 
So what are some possible workarounds when random assignment to conditions is not possible? Well, one possibility is to use what's called a waitlist control. So a waitlist control is where you have people who are on a waitlist for treatment serve as a control comparison. So you may be very well aware that in Ontario, if you want to receive certain medical benefits, such as mental health benefits, you may be on a long wait list in order to receive those benefits. These wait lists are not ideal and reflect larger structural problems, but given their reality, researchers can use those wait lists in order to create natural control conditions in order to compare to people who have reached the treatment stage. Equating occurs when a researcher uses stratified or quota sampling to ensure a relatively equal balance of potentially confounding characteristics within the sample. And matching occurs when researchers are able to identify match controls for those in the treatment condition to offer a pseudo-equal comparison. So let's take a look at each of these. Imagine that you've started a new program to offer some kind of service to people within your community. Your service begins in April, which is when people can sign up for the service. When they sign up for the service, they complete a questionnaire describing their symptoms and characteristics. One month later, the treatment begins. Again, as the treatment is beginning, your participants complete another questionnaire describing their symptoms and various factors going on. In June, at the completion of the program, they complete another follow-up questionnaire. And in July, their recovery is assessed now let's say that because you had your treatment condition in May, that opens up a new treatment opportunity for June. So you may similarly have people sign up in May in order to receive a treatment in June for which you would they would receive follow-up measurements in June and July. And this could continue for June and July and so on and so forth. So if you have a pattern like this where you have people signing up and being put on some kind of wait list or just having some kind of naturally occurring wait that occurs before the sign up and the treatment begins. And then you are able to track participants at the sign up phase, the treatment phase, and some kind of follow up phase. Then this creates an ideal situation for a quasi experimental study. And this is what we mean by a wait list design. So, for example, in May, you would have those who are undergoing the treatment, and you would have those who have signed up to be part of the program, but who have not yet begun. Because there really shouldn't be too many systematic differences between those who start the program in April versus May, this would be, again, not as ideal as randomly assigning people to conditions, but we shouldn't have too many reasons to believe that these two groups would be fundamentally different from one another. In June, we would have the advantage of having a treatment and a control condition, as well as information about what the outcomes might be one month later. And in July, you can compare the control, the treatment, follow-up, and some kind of two-month longitudinal recovery. So again, waitlist designs can be an ideal design for conducting quasi-experimental research. So you may recall that we have already talked about equating and matching within the context of an experimental design. It's important to point out that quasi-experimental equating and matching is somewhat different than experimental equating and matching. So when we talked about equating within the context of an experiment, we talked about equating being used as a method for creating a system for having some kind of unbiased assignment to conditions. So in this situation, participants were screened, that screening information was entered into a computer, and then a computer used an, an algorithm in order to create relatively equal groups based on the information that was given. In contrast, in a quasi-experimental design where you're not able to randomly assign people to conditions, and so you have to rely on groups that are naturally formed, well, what happens is that the equating occurs after the fact. 
So maybe you have a large pool of people who have gone through a treatment versus not, and what you do is you use um, equating in order to choose the sample from this larger group of people who have gone through the treatment versus not, in order to select a sample where your treatment condition and your control condition are as equal as possible. Similarly, with matching, in a true experiment, you first match people on some pre-existing characteristic, and then you randomly assign one of the matched pairs to the treatment and the other person in the pair to a control. In a quasi-experiment, you already have the existing conditions, and so after you've collected your data, that's when you would go through and try to find people within the treatment condition to match with people in the control condition prior to doing the analysis. So there are some subtle differences between the equating that's used in a randomized, controlled study, a true experiment, and those that are used in a quasi-experiment where random assignment to conditions is not possible. So let's take a look at what this might look like in a real study. So Stan et al. Um, published a note in 2019 examining whether being socially isolated in Antarctica changed volume within the hippocampus, an area of the brain that's involved in learning and memory. So for their social isolation group, they studied over time nine polar expeditioners, five men and four women, who lived in Antarctica for 14 months. To create a comparison group in which to compare the data that was collected from these nine people, they created a control group with nine controls that were matched for age, sex, and initial hippocampal volume. And these control participants were also observed over a several month period. So here is a table that they included in their report. And we can see that because the control group and the expedition group have been matched on age, the age is exactly equivalent. There are exactly four women and five men included in the study. Um, they, it appears that the two samples are relatively matched on height, on body mass, um, as well as brain volume at the start of the study. So this is a great example of using some kind of match design in order to create a comparison group within a quasi-experimental design. They're not randomly assigning who will go on the expedition versus not, but they're trying to create a, a quasi-experimental control condition that allows the researchers to kind of co-create what a randomized study might look like. With that said, even when matching, equating, and waiting list groups are um, employed, selection effects may still linger. And this is because in a true experiment, random assignment to conditions is able to control for both known and unknown selection effects. In contrast, in a quasi-experimental method, the researchers are only able to control for the factors that are known or suspected and can be explicitly designed for. So true experiments are still always going to be better than quasi-experiments, but quasi-experiments certainly have some internal validity advantages over correlational studies. So that's our first condition of causality. Now we're going to move on to our second condition of causality, which is examining temporal precedence.